Let's welcome Vipin Kalra. He's going to talk about what closes are actually. Let's, let's give him a big round, guys. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, I'll quickly introduce myself again just because I like to do that every time. Uh, so, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vipin. I'm a software engineer and instructor. Everybody might have guessed that. And I work for Scalar. A little more on that later, right? Just a little more on that later, for sure. But here's me, as you can see it. I just wanted to show you what I look like when I'm not asked to wake up at 6 and give a talk at 10 in the morning. So if you meet me later, I look a little different, you know the reason already. Let's get to the topic because I've got small, a little bit of time here. What are JavaScript closures, right? Let me give it a try. Perfect. So uh, can everybody see there's a function there? It's a weird function because it prints the reality because it feels like a microwave outside. If you step out, you'll feel like it. Uh, those who are not from Delhi, they'll definitely feel like it. Uh, but the weird thing about this function is not that it prints this message. The weird thing about this function, it's a weird function, because it's using a variable from outside the curly braces. Weird. And that's closure. Right? That's, that's, that's essentially what JavaScript closures are. Thanks. So you just attended the smaller session in this entire workshop. Uh, but I'm just joking. <laughs> Let's understand how this works, right? Cool. So we have another function. I currently have the state that I am in. If nobody can see that emoji, it's a sleeping emoji. Because uh, currently we are, but maybe we'll be awake by the end of this session. And uh, we have a tell state function. It's a similar function which uses a variable outside of its curly braces. So similar situation as we were in earlier. And I tell my uh, V8 transpiler, I tell my JavaScript transpiler, uh, sorry, uh, interpreter to run this function. What all would my interpreter need? My interpreter obviously needs the function definition, right? It needs to know what to run. But alongside of that, this function contains some information which does not reside within the definition. It's using a variable which resides outside the definition, or let's just say the parent scope or the lexical environment uh, in cool JavaScript terms. terms. One thing we developers like to do is give everything cool terms, right? We could have called it parent scope, we called it the lexical environment for some reason. So uh, we need this variable for my interpreter to give me the output. It's as simple as that. So what I'll simply do is, or what my interpreter would simply do is, it will bundle it all together, put it in a package, call it a closure because again, cool terms, and feed it into the interpreter. Because now, everything that is required, which is one, my function definition, and two, the lexical environment around that function, since it's being used by the function, is available to my interpreter. And it'll give you the output, which is my current state, and you can see it. Cool. Might not be clear still, so I'll take like two more examples to make it like very, very distinctly clear if possible. Cool. We're looking at a function here. The function says, Bhai achha hu. for those people who don't understand Hindi, this function is I am great or I am good. Right. It takes the three variables, like prints the sum of those three variables, right? So uh, when I run this function, what in cool developer terms we call it, is a pure function. Why? Because Everything that is required within if, in this function definition is present in this function definition. It does not require anything from the lexical environment. So simply JavaScript, I'll go very, very quickly. The function gets pushed to the call stack or the function uh, execution context gets pu pushed to the call stack. Call stack. Uh, Akshay would be mad if I don't say that. Uh, the data values of A, B, and C get stored in the memory. Execution is done, six is printed, and the data is removed. The function gets popped from the call stack. It's very quick. It gets there, data is stored, memory is cleared, function is removed. Simple, right? But let's move to the second function. It's the first function that we saw in the slides that I presented to you. It's an impure function. Why do we call it an impure function? Because this function uses something that is not present within its function definition. Or I could say it in a term that if I change something in its lexical environment, it would directly impact the result this function would give me for the same output. So let's just say I change the value of outside, which is something outside the function definition, and I give it the same message, which is feels like, the output would change. So for the same input, it could return different outputs. In pure function. And how it happens, like we have already learned in closures, is that the interpreter creates a closure with the function and all the external variables that it is referencing outside of the function definition. So Anything which is outside of these curly braces, it just picks it all together, bundles it together with the function definition, and keeps it at one place. 
wear this, it keeps it in the heat memory. Now there's a difference there. JavaScript usually keeps stuff in the mail memory along with the call stack, right? But why heat memory? Because heat memory is log lived. It would remain in the heat memory till JavaScript garbage collector comes into the picture and does some shit, right? Okay. So cool. And then the closure in the inside of the heap memory is used when I call this weird function. Simple. Pretty straightforward if I think about it. Cool. We have five more minutes, right? Then why closures? Because from what I've talked about, one, it requires more memory for more time rather because it's stored in the heap memory, which is log lib. Call stack, you put something in the call stack, it gets executed in a stack, and then it pops off. But heap memory is log lib. So memory intensive, right? And again, it requires more processing power as well to a certain degree because it's processing the lexical environment and the function definition simultaneously. It needs to process both of those things. So processing itself, intensive, sorry, my bad. Then why do we use it? Now, I have a simple use case. I hope most of the people are smiling by now. If they were not, that's my assumption. So uh, I have a state. Again, I have a similar context as to the, what I use to teach everyone. There's an IAM inner function. And there's an IAM outer function. The good thing about this is that if I expose the IAM outer function, it completely encap en uh, encapsulates everything inside of the IAM inner function and its closure. So while IAM inner has access to everything inside of IAM outer, vice versa is not true. So I could very simply say that IAM inner and its closure is completely encapsulated within IAM outer. So data encapsulation is a major, major feature where we use JavaScript closures. There's also tons and tons of other examples where you could use them, but I won't dive into them because I have just 15 minutes to teach you guys what JavaScript closures are. And now we come to the dreaded question. The question that everybody gets asked, the question that most of us have gotten wrong at least once in our lives. So let's talk about how, what exactly is going on. First of all, if somebody tells you that this is a JavaScript closures question, don't go to that company. This is not a closures question. This is a question where we talk about var versus let. Well, let's talk about what closures are doing in this question, right? Uh, there's a for loop, inside of the for loop, there's a function which prints the counter of that for loop, and then there's a set timeout, which calls that function or invokes that function after 100 milliseconds, or 100 milliseconds, I believe. Yes. Cool. So uh, what happens is, uh, first of all, what's the output of this question? What? How many people here, like, we'll do raised hands. How many people here say, obviously, it's 0, 1, 2? 0, 1, 2, I have to thought it's basically right? <laughs> Cool. So how many people here say 3, 3, and 3, right? OK. The crowd knows it's JavaScript, I believe. How many people say, say that JavaScript is weird, it'll print some 4, 5, 6, or something like that? <laughs> it's JavaScript. Anything can happen, right? Uh, cool. So uh, I'll tell you what happens. Var gets hoisted to the global scope. Everybody knows that. We have a var variable. It gets stored in the global scope. Closures are created, individual closures. So there's three closures that are placed in our heap for each iteration of the log function. Whenever each, each time the log function is defined, a closure is created, right? Which is thrice. But all three of those are referencing the same var variables, which is present in the global scope. Okay. So all three of them reference the same var variable. All three of, since these closures are present in the heap memory, they are still present when the function is called after 100 milliseconds. Think about it. If they weren't in heap, they would have just gotten stamped. They are in heap, that's why they are present. And that's why the final value of var, which is three, gets printed thrice. That's the real output. When you change it to let, weird stuff starts to happen. And that's something, again, that which I don't, won't dive into right now because it's a class of closures. This is a question on let and back. So prove your interview wrong whenever he asks you that question. And that's JavaScript closures, guys. Genuinely, that's, that is JavaScript closures because that's it. But wait, just a second. I, I'm doing a lot of like cinematic pauses, but this got left out. I saved myself two minutes. Uh, and I'll take just two minutes to talk about the company that's brought me here. Right. Uh, Scalar. So uh, very, very quickly, uh, Scalar is a red tech company. Most of you would know that. There's hundreds of them out there. Why are we different? Uh, we are different because we want to build uh, uh, excellence ka karte, success. Ka so, 
uh, simple as that. So we want to make you excellent engineers and not just successful engineers. We want, don't want to get you into biggest companies. We want you to become the biggest engineers in the biggest companies. So we want to train you how to perform once you get there. Right? But I won't like spoil a lot of your time by talking about the details here. There's a lot of people from my team who are outside. There's a booth that Scalar has. Uh, feel free to visit any time during the day. I'll be there. A lot of our career counselors would be there. A lot of people from our team would be there. Uh, you could talk to them. You could interact with them. Have a chat. Talk about the rest of the tech world also. Uh, completely open to that. Uh, you must have gotten a brochure which has a QR code, brochure from Scalar. You could scan that QR code and you will get a form. Fill that form and you will get a goodie bag. This is a, uh, I guess a quiz question as well. Answer that quiz question and just like people are for offering iPads, they're not offering an iPad, but we do have a OnePlus smart code uh, up for that. So uh, the, as the sessions keep on happening, it gets more exciting for you all. So you, uh, you get a chance to build a WordPress smartphone. Please feel free to visit our booth, talk to us, interact with us. Uh, there's activities and quizzes going on there as well. There's prizes for that. And yeah, so uh, this is our booth right outside. It doesn't look like that. Uh, Devru, Sakshav, and uh, Shubham from our team are present there. You could please look at these pretty faces and talk to them if you feel like it. And thanks, everyone, for real this time. That's it. Thank you, Bipin. Thank you. Uh, that's a very good uh, uh, image, actually. It was a very funny image. Thank you for sharing that.